Well, hello, Roger. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here. And where I am, it is freezing. I don't know where you are. Well, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. It's chilly ah. for Atlanta, for the South, <laughs> but probably a little warmer than where you are. I envy you for two reasons. Um, one, um, my admiration for Georgia, particularly recently. And two, my granddaughter is at Emory. So um, oh. I have a great friend in Jericho Brown at Emory. Uh, so um, uh, my feelings about Georgia, which were always sky high, because I remember going to the Martin Luther King Church when I was a, in journalism, um, are even sky higher, so high. Wow. Well, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, but I want to I want to jump right in. I want to talk about your new book. It's incredible. It's deceptively small. There's a lot packed in there. Um, but to, to start off, why this book? Why now? What's interesting, Liz, is that I didn't mean the now. I wrote this book on, another, on the occasion of something entirely personal. I, uh, I was in a house in on the Jersey Shore, which I, I uh, um, stayed in for about a month. And I saw the moon rising. Um, I thought it was a harvest moon. I was too ignorant to know that what it really was. And it turned out uh, uh, to be uh, the cold moon, the moon that augurs the winter solstice. And I thought, well, I'm approaching or in the winter solstice of my life. So what do I believe in? And so I believe in life, love and responsibility, the subtitle of the book. And I wrote the book. It was on its way to publication before uh, the pandemic hit. Oh, wow. Isn't so that I, interesting? I, I looked smart. I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it was just a coincidence. But the themes, I guess, uh, as I've gathered from the reception of the book, the themes applied directly to the, to the pandemic, to the fear, um, frankly, to the fear of death. Exactly, exactly. And that's what really comes across. But it's, it's almost like entering your mind as as the writer. And that is your style. It's so it's been compared to that of a jazz musician, and it just flows so beautifully. How did you decide that that was going to be your style? Did you decide? Or how did that come to be your form of expression? It's such a good question. Um, at least in my experience, style develops over time. Uh, there might be in history a half a dozen writers um, like Jane Austen or uh, Virginia Woolf or Joyce, who hit the hit the song they were going to play as soon as they started to play it. I certainly wasn't like that. Most writers I know aren't like that. Style has to do with growing and to uh, and some sort of, sort of uh, form of self discovery. I was always a piano player in the sense I've always played by ear. I'm not really great, but I'm good enough to get by. And the um, the idea of jazz is if you make a mistake in jazz, the next thing you want to do is make another mistake so as to make the first mistake seem deliberate. <laughs> I, was, I, I was okay at that. I could do that. Um, and then the feeling of the beauty of jazz in terms of uh, trans, uh, transportation into writing uh, was that I'm going to surprise you and I'm going to surprise myself. Best review I ever got, best, the best in terms of um, somebody who really got what I was tossing was Pete Hamill. And Pete Hamill said he writes to surprise himself. He was so right. That's exactly what I do. Sometimes I actually, I'll write something, my head will snap back and I'll say, did I write that? Did I say that? Do you feel like there is some kind of divine connection when you are writing, like you are a vessel for the words, for the ideas, for the thoughts that are coming out? I'd like to be a vessel, not necessarily for anything divinity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume um, uh, or sully a God with my presence, but I'd like to be a vessel for other people. I'd like to think that what I was saying, you're saying, you're thinking, Liz, and uh, others uh, and friends and uh, strangers. The beauty of writing is you're writing for strangers, really. Um, I have no idea. Uh, I'm delighted to meet you and honored to meet you. Um, I didn't know that you would be reading my book when I wrote it. Uh, and now I'm very glad you did. Yeah, now we're having this conversation and talking about the greater life lessons. Um, was there anything that surprised you when writing the book? You said your head snapped back a couple times in other instances. What about this book in this in this case? Yeah, almost almost all the time. Um, it's one thing to say that you believe in something. It's one, it's another thing to prove it. And so uh, the book, in the sense, is proving all three things: the love of life, the love of love, and responsibility. And I began to see uh, 
responsibility in its widest applications. I talk about uh, a beetle in a, on a tree, on a uh, mimosa tree in Texas uh, that goes out to the branch of the tree, lays her eggs and dies. And the eggs then hatch in the branch which falls and the tree dies and the beetles go on to another tree and nature is responsible for itself. One element in nature being responsible uh, for the other. Um, microchimerism, you may know that, that uh, process. It's breathtaking. In a, in a mother, speaking of mothers, in a mother, this incredible thing that goes on in the placenta where the cells of the, the child coming into existence are shared by the mother. Uh, and then the, the child carries those cells when she or he emerges, mother holds on to the cells for the next child. So the first child has given a kind of strength to the second child, a physical strength that uh, nature has provided. Um, it, it, it takes your breath away that the, uh, this uh, forethought on nature's part of sustaining the species or doing something to sustain, sustain the species, responsible for each other, responsible with each other. Um, and then the more conventional uh, uh, things as, uh, as I deal with too, the, the idea that we, uh, um, we have to reach out to each other. And particularly in a time like this, when there are so many people who believe the opposite and act on it, uh, we have to reach out to each other. Um, can I tell you about a project I'm, deal I'm doing? Please do. Okay. Because uh, it's brand new and it starts on Monday, as a matter of fact, Monday, February 1st. And, um, and it's called Right America. It's the first thing I ever organized. I can't imagine myself organizing anything that works, but so far, <laughs> so far, so good. I was watching the Biden, expect um, uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden uh, acceptance speeches around November 10th or 11th. It took that a while, thanks to Georgia, it uh, uh, pushing it, putting it over took that while to ascertain that they were indeed president and vice president, no matter what else is said now. Okay. That very night, there were riots in the streets. And I mean riots, you know, people punching each other out and all this stuff that I remember from my, my uh, uh, childhood, uh, except this was worse. Um, I have seen civil rights and I have seen Vietnam and this was worse. Uh, the vehemence was worse. The zealotry, zealotry, much, much worse. So, um, I thought, what could writers possibly do to ameliorate the situation? The situation, Because, I mean, nothing directly, but when we write, we assume a human family. We assume in the, the antithesis of what was going on in the streets, that people share the same shames, the same loves, the same griefs, the same desires, the same hopes, the same joys, and so forth. That sharing, then, that ex one experiences in reading can be emphasized, can be actually nailed. So I wrote to a few writers and I said, would it appeal to you to make a little organization of this and do some readings in its behalf? Darn thing uh, got to 60 writers. We are we attached to a wonderful bookstore, the largest independent bookstore on Long Island called Book Review. It starts Monday with Rita Dove and Billy Collins, two former uh, U.S. poet laureates. Wow. And it goes on in a, in a just a stellar, wonderful list of friends and then they recommended friends and um, uh, and so forth. And we it's, we're going to try to do some good. So to bring it back to your question, I realize I've been yammering, but the to bring it back to your question, responsible for each other. Uh, these writers, sixty writers, all well known writers, and most of them, some of them are emerging writers, which I like too. Um, realize that as private as we are, writers, as generally antisocial as we are, I mean. I talking to you this morning is my social life. <laughs> Same. Um, um, the fact the fact is uh, uh, that we're aware of the human family and, and owe it something. Yeah. Do you think it's your artistic spirit that that recognizes that that wants to connect that wants to heal the world, uh, or do you think that's something that we all can share? But writers are just more alive and alert to it. I think absolutely we all can share it. And I've seen it in other people far more actively and far more effectively than writers. We do what we can do. Uh, when my daughter died, I remember somebody saying, how could you write about this? And I said, if I were a carpenter, I'd build a bench. It's what I do. Mm. So 
Uh, yes, absolutely. In short answer to your que uh, question, you, I, people we know and admire, uh, all uh, uh, doing everything responsible for each other. I live in a small town. The people who run the stores in this town, the pharmacy, the grocery, uh, everything else, I know them to be as responsible or more responsible, certainly, than the writers I know. <laughs> well, and how much, how much was your mother's influence in, in the way that you see the world, in the way that you approach art and writing and music even? I'm so glad you're asking this question now and that you didn't ask this question 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, I, of course, you were two years old 20 years ago. So <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll say that. <laughs> you would have rather been in, inarticulate, but um, uh, 20 years ago, I really didn't pre appreciate what my mother was, uh, had done uh, for me. Uh, but the years since I started to think about my childhood far more, far more appreciatively, actually. And uh, my mother was a school teacher and she was a hoot. Um, uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful person. Leave, leave aside for a mother, for just for a child to admire and watch. I can still see her as I'm talking to you now in those uh, wonderful dresses of the 1940s and how, how classy she looked and how, uh, and how spirited she was. She was a, a teacher in a junior high school, public junior high school in New York. Um, and uh, when she uh, came home, I had her for a few hours each day. And I write in uh, Cold Moon about going just for a walk with her. Yeah. And you can see how sassy she was and how smart she was and how self-confident too. And everybody greeted her in the street. Hi, Molly. And she would, she would uh, 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 greet them back. No, the, uh, the memories of uh, her are thoroughly admiring. I, um, uh, it's as if I'm watching her now and I outlived her. Uh, it's as if I'm watching her now and saying, that was a person, that was somebody of substance, that was a woman. Hmm. I got chills when you were saying that. Do you think it's common that, you know, the older we get, the more we reflect on our childhood, the more we want to kind of measure up and see how we did in life. And then, you know, if there's more that we can do, then have time to do that. Why do you think we always reflect back the older we get? Well, I think there are stages of it. I think there are a lot, there's a stage of life where we blame everything in our childhood. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's the cheap way out. But most people I know do it. I am this way because my father was mm -hmm. that way. I am this way because my mother was the, uh, another way. Then you start to realize these were just people and they were doing their best in most cases. And uh, you begin to appreciate what that best, uh, what that best meant, uh, certainly. Um, uh, I'm married to a wonderful mother. Uh, she gave birth to a wonderful mother. Uh, I had the joy and privilege of seeing this, at least in our daughter's case, for a long time um, before she died. And the, um, these lessons uh, of to talk about responsibility uh, of a mother are astonishing. I also noticed that women change from before they have children to after they have children. Before they have children, um, it's not that they're irresponsible, but they uh, an idea of uh, the world owes me something, and I'm, enjoy I'm enjoying it, and I'm having a great time, and I'm sexy, and so forth and so on. When they have children, um, in most cases, you see almost see it physically. They uh, they know that they are responsible in the world for the um, for the propagation of the world, yeah. uh, and for the uh, the ethics of the world, and the kindness of the world. It's a whole different uh, deal, much more so than fathers. Fathers can have a have. They, we have our function. Um, we we have we have our uses, but not like a mother. A mother does really does everything. Well, you are a father. Coming from the father's perspective, how do you create a positive legacy? You know, for your children, for the rest, for your students, for the rest of the world. What have you actively put into place in your life? Well, I hope this Write America does something. It certainly is going to say something to my writing students. I teach writing at Stony Brook, and we um, uh, we have a nice department, a very good department, in fact, of very good writers, some of whom I've been enlisted in Write America. Um, uh, so there's that to, to always uh, show this. I, I don't, I'm never shy about talking about the news in my classes. Uh, that used to be uh, kind of tasteless and forbidden, and maybe it still is, but I, I use it to talk about writing and how you write about it the world. Uh, so I do that. 
But as a father, and actually an active father, I never thought of myself any, as anything much more than an entertainer. I'm a pretty good entertainer. <laughs> uh, but, but no. Not the disciplinarian, I'm surprised. Oh, oh, are you kidding? Why does one get married? The, the, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea when, when Amy died, when our daughter died, she was 38, and Ginny and I, my wife and I, moved down to uh, Maryland to help rear them, to help our son-in-law we were our children. We lived there seven and a half years. So it was a long time uh, that we were uh, with them. And I realized perfectly well how, in a sense, useless I was. I was useful for, for specific things. I mean, um, the, I, was an ex I, was a, I was an extremely good entertainer. And so when they wanted entertainment rather than education or a moral improvement, they turned to me. But everything else, uh, they turned to my wife. Uh, it's, important for, it's important for men to know our place. Uh, it's good to have balance always. You don't want the same message all the time. Yeah. Um, but I do, I have to, there were so many quotes. I have your book all tabbed up, but there was one quote that I wanted to read and then have you expand on the other side. It said, better to know where to go than how to get there. I wander from thought to thought, having learned but three things from my long night's moon. I believe in life. I believe in love. I believe we are responsible for each other. Can you expand on that? That's where I was going in the book. It comes early in the book, and I announced this is what this book is about. It's important for writers to do that. You don't, you don't want to let too many pages pass before you're telling the reader whose attention span is very limited. Most of our, you know that from yourself as a reader, and I certainly know it for myself, for myself as a reader. You want somebody to say, you are about to read this. So I said that. I, I, said that. Um, I know these three, these three things. And it took a while to... Uh, to narrow them down. Uh, what was I, what did I want to say? If this were a will, what did I want to leave? And the, uh, the idea that life and love and responsibility are, are, are the only three things, in fact, that I truly believe in. That is, I've, you know, I've, everything ramifies from those, uh, from those uh, three uh, qualities or beliefs. Um, and, the, and so I, uh, I wandered from thought to thought, as you know, in the book. It's also, I, that, I was, that was part of the announcement too. I, I was saying to the reader, do not expect sequential thought in this book. <laughs> you are, you are, you are gonna, you're gonna hop with me. And if you think it's worthwhile, just stay, uh, stay there and we'll play jazz together. Yes, and that's exactly how it felt while reading it. I mean, you're going in the past and then you have philosophy and then you just, you have these heavy hitting, like I had to put the book down to really process what I had just read. And then I was like anxious to get back to it. But I mean, when do you think that you really solidified these beliefs, these these hard truths? Were you in your 30s, 40s? Like, when did it really become your truth? Such, it's such a good question. I I, I, I I do not know. I do know that my youth, my uh, youth in terms of my 20s, uh, was all ambition. And none of these thoughts, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I was aware of, dimly aware of an appreciation of life and love and responsibility, but nothing in terms of being active. And I had the misfortune of being famous when I was in my 20s. Um, it, was, it was a misfortune, but then it turned out to be a fortune, meaning that I knew what it was to get public attention very early. And so I knew how actually useless it is and uh, that it is a very bad thing to uh, aim for. And it wasn't exactly aiming for it, but it happened at Harvard when we, there were the, there were the riots in the '60s, and I became a central figure among those riots. And then, when the presidency of Harvard uh, uh, became available because of the retirement of a previous president, I was first on a list of 200, then on a list of 100, then on a list of three. Wow. And when uh, um, I, at age 28, was being considered for the, I couldn't. They could not have chosen a worse person. If if they had if they if they had done it, I don't know what I would have done. Um, in fact, at one point I said, look, I was going to write to them, look, guys, I am not capable of being president of Harvard. Um, but then I thought, well, then that presumes they're going to choose me. So I didn't say anything. Anyway, I was scared to death when I got down to three and so relieved when it got to Derek Bach, who was now a dear friend and, um, and then was then uh, two and was a great president of Harvard. But I was in a poem in The New Yorker. I, I, was, I, was, I also taught the first African-American literature course. So I was in uh, another thing in Newsweek, etc. And I was a person to be looked at, which has all the, uh, the trapping, I mean, all the traps 
as well as the rewards. Actually, there are very few rewards. These are the momentary rewards and the, uh, the others uh, are attended by suspicion and envy and all the things that people are normally capable of. But I was glad to get it past me. And then in my 30s and 40s, I started to go where you were talking about when I started to think, what is good this life going to be? And that was at that time I turned to writing. Mm. I love how much you appreciate beauty in the world. That was a big part of the book that I really connected with. How do you live a beautiful life at any age, even when you're you know, dealing with the trappings of fame and notoriety versus, you know? Older. Well, now it's a lead pipe cinch. I live a quarter of a mile from the ocean and hardly a day passes that I don't see it. Um, the ocean is a very strange uh, thing and in a way it's, it's perilous and it's dangerous and it covers three quarters of the world uh, quietly. You know, it's, like a, it's like a sleeping monster. Most of the time it's quiet. Uh, you're in it, then you swim in it and it's quite beautiful and then you realize one wrong turn, one um, uh, wave that decided uh, to knock you out, uh, and you've had it. it. The that all of nature is in an ocean, uh, in the in the water and what's under the water, and I began to learn about nature little by little. I wrote a book called Kayak Morning, in which I took my kayak out and just learned. What, was the, what were the trees I was seeing? What were the plants I was seeing? And the, and the, and the beetles and uh, all of those things. They can't help but expand your appreciation of life. Mm. Do you feel like nature has been a great influence in your writing and your growth as a person? Lately, yes. In the last, I would say last 10 years, definitely. The more I, more, the more I learned, the more I realized, the more I appreciated. Uh, I did not uh, as a younger man, but now, absolutely. Why do you think it takes living a life and having tragedy and then hard times help us? Why does it make us wake up so much more acutely than anything else? You're, you're right, Liz, and I don't know why, except that um, we have a choice of being alert to the things that happen to us or looking the other way. It's better to be alert to them. So uh, in terms of great moments in one's life, you can celebrate. And in terms of moments like our daughter's death, um, look at look at it. It brings you to your knees to be sure, but then you have a choice, either you stay on your knees or stand up and do something. So uh, we did something. And um, uh, all, of these, all of these things are part of our moral and ethical education, but it shouldn't only end with us. That's so we get back to responsibility, what you were talking about before. Uh, it shouldn't only end with us. So if there's an opportunity to pick somebody else up, do it, You'd be a fool not to. Do you think that's what got you through the death of your daughter? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that and the, and the help of friends. Jim Lehrer was one of my best friends. He died a year ago. And Jim was at my side all the time, all the time during this. Um, sometimes not saying anything, which is the mark of a friend, you know, mm -hmm. just, just, just have the companionship uh, and know what uh, you want to do for somebody else. He was a model of what, how to behave, a model of, of moral behavior. What did you love most about him? <laughs> His desire to get into fist fights. What? Um, it, honestly, I swear, it, it, it was just nuts. I mean, we were all, we were both old. I mean, we, our last fist fight was probably when we were 12, but he um, uh, <laughs> had a great temper. And once, once we were walking along a narrow uh, road and some kids came by, meaning 20 year olds came by, by on bikes, not, not motorcycles, but real bikes, but a little too close to Jim. <laughs> Jim says, come back here, you son of a bitch. And, <laughs> I, 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 and I said to him, are you nuts? Uh, do you want, you want to say, you know, uh, that you want the obituary that we died uh, in, a, in a fight with uh, uh, a dozen uh, teenagers because we didn't like their bikes? About six or seven years later, he is, um, uh, we were living this time we were living in bethesda with our grandchildren and his wife kate called me and said would you take him for a walk like a dog would you take him for a walk so i uh i of course i came over and he had just had a heart he had he had, had a heart episode i don't know if it was a, a full-fledged heart attack but his heart was weak only physically only physically <laughs> and um the uh uh, he, she said, uh, go out with him because she wants, wanted him to have company on this walk. So we're walking in Cleveland Park, a neighborhood in Washington, and a truck 
stops, but not exactly on the white stop line, maybe half a foot beyond it. Blair looks up and, and starts to fight with the guy in the, in the truck. And, and, and luckily I had him on a leash. I, uh, it was just, it was just <laughs> pull him back. <laughs> but, <laughs> you asked me what I most remembered. I wrote just hilarious moments about uh, that. He was always ready to, uh, uh, to whack somebody who was getting, who annoyed him. At the same time, I, you cannot imagine a man who was more actively helpful for, to his friends. If, if he, had, if he detected that you needed something, he would provide it. And that, not, not just me. I mean, I'm not just some, somebody who worked with when I um, did essays and things like that. I remember a waiter in a restaurant. He, uh, he talked to the waiter, waiter. Every time you talked to Jim Lehrer, you were the only person on earth. Mm. He would look at you, Liz, uh, Liz Carlisle, he would say to you, you are the only person on earth and I'm devoted to you for however long we talk. It's a rare, rare quality. It is. It is, especially now. And, you know, and even as you write in the book, you know, people aren't reading as much. They're not, you know, the books aren't even the thing. But when you can really get someone's attention like that, it's such a gift. It's such a gift. And I felt while reading your book that you were really giving that attention. You know, I was getting a, a, a perfect view into into your life story. And, and it's probably just a tiny little glimpse of that. But it was such an expansive glance it was like a dream I, I felt i felt the presence of the reader quite often um actually when you uh the only <laughs> the only jazz player i've ever seen who never seemed to in, know that an audience was around was Thelonious monk and i don't know if you've ever seen a performance of Thelonious monk but it, it is in a way hilarious he's playing something that he wrote brilliant he's playing it brilliantly he's absorbed it entirely the whole audience is just on its edge just listening to every half note he gets up, looks up, and sees and seems surprised that anybody was watching. Mm -hmm. He's so he was so entirely within himself. Uh, most people, writers, musicians, are not. I certainly am not. And I want to be aware of an audience. I want I want to, when I say something funny, I want to make sure that you're laughing. Um, and maybe uh, other sides of mortality. Uh, Thelonious Monk had no signs of mortality. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, that, that provokes another question. What do you want people to feel when they, do you want them to feel something when they read your work or is it just a, a cathartic process of healing for yourself? No, I would, I definitely want them to feel something uh, for it. I want, I want them to, I want them, I want to make them believe what I've said and I want them to profit from what I've said. And uh, if, if they, if it is worth their time, I want them to uh, spend their time thinking about it. This, this little book um, is successful. I, I never thought it, that it was going to be uh, uh, successful. But if it is successful, uh, as it seems to be a little, um, it's simply because uh, I say something to Liz Carlisle, and Liz Carlisle says something to her friends, and their friends say something to their friends. Uh, and it all seems to make sense, and um, I hope a beautiful sense. No, it does that. It does that. It, it helps everything that I think all of us are going through make a little more sense. And it gives us a wider view of what life is about and what it truly means. Um, but with everything that you've learned in life, um, do you feel like it's culminated into this book or do you feel like you have more in you? Got one more thing that I've been working on, but it's not like this book. Um, we are now, everybody, uh, going through a terribly scary time. Um, maybe you're uh, the people who listen to your podcast will disagree with me. I like to talk to people who disagree with me, so I'm not dismissing them at all. But I think Trump was a terrible thing for the country. Uh, and yet, in some ways, um, beneficial in the sense that he unearthed the divisions in this country that I was entirely unaware of. I thought there were differences, to be sure. But I had no idea the severity of the differences. And you better, you know, know your enemy. Right. Um, you, the... Uh, uh, it's good to know those differences. That's what Right America is about to try to heal the different, uh, uh, heal the differences. And then we have this plague, um, which can knock us off. The Black Plague in Europe lasted 500 years. The hmm. the uh, um, I mean, it's uh, it's terrifying. It's it is amazing how quickly we came up with a vaccine. It is it will be more amazing if we're sure the vaccine or another vaccine works. More amazing still if these variant strains can be. Uh, tackled and science is to be just wondered at and, uh, and applauded. But to have a political scare or a social scare, like a whole cadre of people uh, who really want to knock, knock off the country, 
uh, or, 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 and reshape it in a, uh, in a way that's anti-democratic and against our constitution. And then a plague that just wants to knock us off democratically. They don't, doesn't Like what is them. happening? <laughs> exactly. Uh, a, what? Um, <laughs> so the book is about the what. Uh, the, the book uh, that I'm working on now is trying to, have, it's, it's a meditation on the scary times. Mm, I can't wait for that. Um, do you have a particular writing process? Do you have a morning routine or how do you do your best work? I get up um, very early. Uh, partly because I did that naturally. And then when we were living with our grandchildren, I wanted to get up before they did. So mm. grab a couple of hours before they did. Now I get up at four o'clock regularly. I'm totally useless uh, to, uh, <laughs> to everybody. But and sometimes it's really, it's really scary. I will start to write and I'll get a message from a friend or something at four o'clock. I think, God, I, you know, I live in an absolutely mad universe. These, what are these people doing up at four? But it gives me a lot of time to write and I can nap during the day. And the older you get, the less sleep you need, although I'm told you need more, but I seem to need less. Um, the, uh, I don't play music while I write. A lot of writers do. Um, I like, I can write anywhere. So I just like this, uh, the solitude. And after, I mean, it is a kind of easy job in a sense. I mean, any, anybody else, you work for a company, you've got to do what the company wants. The, um, if you're a doctor, you got to go to your sick patients, et cetera. I just need a table and a writing instrument. Mm. Have you ever been in a position though where you're trying to write something, you're trying to express something and you just can't find the right word, the perfect word, which I know that you're very uh, adamant about. Yes, well, uh, lots of times, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and also you're aware when you've used the wrong word, it's, it's, it's like a, um, a pebble in your shoe. Yeah. And, and even if you write it, you think, no, nah, no, nah, it's not right, it's anyway. Um, and sometimes it comes to you right away and sometimes it comes to you a month later, but the, uh, you're always aware when something is not quite, doesn't quite hit the tune, it comes back to jazz. You, you're, you're ending on a sour note. Yeah, what does it feel like when you're writing something and you feel like it's really good? You feel already that the audience is reading it almost at the same time and, and getting that balm, that boost. Maybe it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it is, there is nothing, there is nothing like it. it the, the, when, when you think, that is it, you know, you, 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 you hit it just as you're supposed to hit it. It doesn't happen all the time to be sure, but when it does, you realize why you like you, what you're doing, why, why you like doing what you're doing. Yeah, what was harder, basketball or writing? <laughs> basketball, I get better at basketball the older I get. In other words, the more I remember how I was as a player, the, um, the, uh, uh, the better I am. Right now I'm, oh, I would say roughly six, nine and I'm playing in the NBA. Then. <laughs> I was 5'11 and doing my best to see over a guy guarding me. I like basketball and for many of the same reasons that I like jazz though. It, the way, basketball played the way it's supposed to be played. It's played by five people, not by one. And if you watch the great players, uh, even LeBron and, and uh, um, uh, why is he, his, his great name got out of my uh, mind. Um, but the, if you watch even the great players, they know all of, uh, there are four other people on the court. Not only that, they don't have to look. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things about, and some sort of like by friendship, your friends and my friends, you don't have to look where they are on the court, you know where they are. And so you can do what is called a blind pass or a look away pass, where you just put the ball somewhere on the court because you know that your friend is gonna pick it up or your teammate is gonna. Uh, pick it up. I like that about basketball. That um, uh, sure, I like to score a lot of points and be and uh, being a guard. Um, uh, that's what I was supposed to do. But more than that, uh, I like the feeling of a win, and the win was only achieved with five people. But it seems like you've had that your entire life. You've had this support system of friends and loved ones and family. And you're a big part of that as well. Do you feel like you have this network of connected people all, with, all over the world through your writing and through your work? Uh, yeah, but I, I don't regard them as connected people. I just regard them as friends and, and some are famous and some many more are certainly not. Um, it's just like a kind of a, a buddy system. Um, I belong to a group called the Meatheads. You'll, you'll uh, appreciate that name, all male, of course. Um, and the Meatheads came into existence when Gary Trudeau, the creator of uh, Doonesbury, and with Jim Lair, my closest friend, um, Gary Trudeau and I 
uh, were banned from um, by our wives um, uh, from uh, oh they they actually rejected us they did not want to see movies like Death Wish and things like that <laughs> they, we regarded them as musical comedies so the the uh, because they were tasteful and decent they said you can just go off and see those pictures by yourself you don't need us so we found uh, about uh, seven or eight other guys who have felt the same way all the same low intelligence and low taste and the meatheads now um have continued to meet for 25 years and <laughs> we've even found a way to do it on zoom i know it's nuts uh we've even found a way to do it uh, uh during the uh, uh pandemic i like the i like friendships i like friendships of women and i like friendships of men and I, the uh, and I do believe that friendships of women can exist without the sexual tension. I think they they, they, they can exist on um, mutual admiration, shared interests, and and senses of humor. Sense of humor will do everything for you. Well, and I bet too, like having female students who feel that energy from you, who understand that that's how you think. Like the the amount of women that you have raised up just by having that mentality about interpersonal relationships is just unbound. It's boundless. it's great. It's great. I hear from them all the time. And because I teach writing, I have many more women students than men in mm. the writing programs all through the country. There are many more women than men. Uh, and it's a joy to hear that they're publishing what they're writing, ask, you know, and advice as long as, you know, as long as I'm not inundated and it's rarely. So uh, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's the ongoing pleasure of teaching. It never stops. Music never stops. Yeah. Well, your legacy is just incredible. You're still doing it. I hate to even use the word legacy because you're still actively creating. I want to be a legend, Liz. Everybody <laughs> who's, who's kicking off now is called a legend. And I would love to be a legend. I don't know how they become a legend, but I would certainly like, like that ambition. But until, until such things, which are, should be out of reach for me, I'll just continue to hobble along. Well, tell us, to the woman listening, to the parent listening, how do we all become legendary? How do we all raise each other up and be responsible for each other? And we'll end I wouldn't on worry about being legendary or mythological or anything grand. I would worry about small acts of kindness, which undoubtedly I can tell just looking at you, somebody like you does a uh, hundred times a day. Um, the hello to the person who doesn't expect to be greeted. Uh, the pausing in a store with a clerk who doesn't expect you to pause and... and uh, and chatted. It hardly takes much. And frankly, I find it uh, it's selfish. I find I feel better about life having done it. So I don't think I, I think life is generally made up of small gestures. Mm, that's so beautiful. Um, I think we can we can end on that. The book is Cold Moon. It is out now. Roger, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom and all the work that you're putting out into the world. My thanks to you, Liz. What what I gave you, you drew out. So a million thanks. Oh, thank you. Beautiful.